So hello everybody and welcome to our Living with Lions online lecture series. Um, my name is Gowan Batiste and I'm the Mountain Lion Foundation's Coexistence uh, Programs Manager. And um, what we're going to talk about today is some of our coexistence outreach work. Um, we're in California. Um, we provide support in all 50 states and everywhere that mountain lions are, but this particular discussion is about California. So for context, California has a three strike rule, which um, essentially means that um, when a depredation, which to define a term, a depredation is um, when a, a native animal um, attacks or eats a domestic animal. Um, we have a system in place with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife where we're not supposed to immediately go to lethal removal of animals. So we have multiple steps that are supposed to be taken first. So California, in a lot of ways, has more robust protections than other states, but those rules are often not followed, and there's often a lack of funding and resources to help people follow them. So one of the things that the Mountain Lion Foundation does, and one of the things that I do, is we'll go and support people um, who are having depredation challenges. So that brings us to the lovely uh, discussion that we have today. Um, we're gonna be speaking with Rhonda Wasco, who's co-owner and operator of Beachfront Farm uh, with her husband, Michael. Um, they relocated to the coast with no intention of starting a farm. Um, they established their homestead in 2012 with chickens, goats, and rabbits, but it wasn't until the 2020 pandemic that they started operating at a communal level. Um, being in a rural area, it's important to grow food for the community in preparation for food shortages. They started an acre garden and a small chicken farm. In 2020, they were able to provide fresh organic vegetables and eggs to our neighbors, as well as donating food to our local food bank. Um, I've gotten to have some of their produce and it's great. Um, from there, they grew into a small production farm, supplying organic free range eggs to local customers and some small scale vegetable sales to surrounding farm stands. In addition to contributing to the local food supply, they also make goat milk soap from the milk provided from their goat that is available seasonally. And this year they're focusing on increasing egg production as well as regenerative farming practices to improve the soil health of our land. Um, we hope to continue to grow as, as they work on their infrastructure, growing our chicken flocks, and continuing to support the local food supply on a small scale. So Rhonda, thank you so much for joining us. I was hoping you'd tell us a little bit about your experience of homesteading and deciding to increase your production um, during the 2020 pandemic. Okay, yeah. Um, like I said, when we um, thank you for having me, first of all, Gal, and I, it's um, really a pleasure to be here. So uh, I appreciate the invite. Um, yeah, when we moved our family up here, we had intended just to have a small um, farm so our children could experience growing up on a farm and, um, you know, live birth of animals. And then at, when the 2020 pandemic hit in the very beginning was, um, you know, the season of getting your starts in the ground and that sort of thing. And because we're in such a rural community, um, and I know how emergency response works, um, I knew that if there was going to be food supply shortages that the rural communities were really gonna suffer. So my husband and I um, focused on, we felt like if we could just grow enough food for our neighbors that we could um, help in just our neighborhood, that would, um, that would, be a benefit to the community. And um, so that year we were had a really robust garden and um, and we kind of accidentally became a production farm because all of a sudden we had these customers or you know community members wanting our products and um, especially eggs. Eggs are I can't I could probably have a hundred chickens and still not supply enough eggs to this area. Um, so we just kind of started blossoming from the pandemic and getting to know our community members and local other local farms and we just realized it was such a need and um, we kind of have done everything backwards like we 
grew the farm and now we're trying to rebuild our infrastructure with watering and hoop houses and all those things that really could have should have mm -hmm. come first but we were in an a what we thought was an emergent situation at that time so um yeah so it's been just really sweet to get to know the local farming community and be invited um to webinars like this and also you know we did some work with the um Noyo Food Forest during Earth Day. And so it's been it's been a great um, joy. Great. Well, thank you. And for, for folks who are, we have folks from all over the place. Um, Noyo Food Forest is our local farm to school program, um, which managing that farm to school program was actually my first job when I moved back here from college. Um, so I'm interested in to know as someone who is a, like a first generation farmer who started doing this as an adult, um, how did you feel about coexistence with nature overall? And did that change at all after you experienced an actual depredation? You know, I've always felt like the wildlife comes first. We're really intruding in their environment. And, um, you know, people complain about the lions and, and the bears and the loss, but this is their natural habitat. And we for us, it's really important to support their natural habitat and um, and we have to protect, it's my job to protect our livestock from the animals that are, that live here, you know, and um, so for us, it's always been important to live in harmony with the local wildlife and, and it's really neat to, you know, experience a bear walking through your property it's it's scary but like wow it's a massive bear you know and um the the loss that we had on our farm it's been determined that it was a domestic dog mm -hmm. um and um you know that's a whole nother area because yeah. our farm and our livestock it's we've done a really good job at being predator proof um, especially in the nighttime and evening hours when the wildlife is, you know, looking for food. But we did not prep to have um, a domestic dog attack that happened in the mid-morning hours. Um, so, yeah, it's been great getting to know um, the wildlife. This year I had a um, a quad of bucklings born and I was getting ready to move them into a front pasture and a huge eagle flew over. Um, it's the first year I've seen an eagle on my property but obviously I can't put a two pound baby goat out into a field where there's an eagle so we just um, moved them into a safer area until they got bigger so I we love the natural wildlife around here. Awesome. Well, so that kind of brings us to how we first met, which was via referral after there was a depredation loss on your farm. So, um, and it's, I'm excited to get into like the the nuances of this, um, but, you know, you have a known mountain lion in the area who's still there, who there's been multiple sightings of. So, you know, you have a mountain lion in the area and you have a dead goat. And, um, so it's very, very, very common for, you know, one plus one to equal two in a very intense way for people. Um, so when I came out to troubleshoot, figure out what happened, what to do next, um, you know, get to, you know, really ask you a lot of questions and look at infrastructure and kind of walk through what happened and when it happened. Um, I'm really curious to ask, like, what was it like for you to both to experience that loss, but then also to have a Mountain Lion Foundation representative come visit your farm? I know a lot of what I do, um, it's a lot like Barnyard CSI, you know, we're looking to solve a mystery and then we're looking to give people resources. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious, like, what was that like for you? So the um, morning I found my um, doe deceased, so I had two does at that time, um, so just a really tiny herd. Um, they were twins, and um, and they were just the sweetest little sisters, and so 
we have a big farm dog load. So I have four domestic farm dogs. And um, that, that's a picture of Luna. She was my trauma response purchase, which we can get into later. We're going to get um, into Luna. And the morning that we lost our goat, the, the domestic dogs that we have, our other farm dogs, I took them to drop the kids off at school with me. Sometimes they wanted to load up and go for a, a car ride. So my, I really left our farm completely unprotected that morning. Um, and so the attack happened between the time I left like at 8.30 in the morning to get the kids to school. And when I came back at nine, my goat was dead. And um, she experienced a horrible death. It was very traumatic to find her that way. Um, her sister that is still living um, was super traumatized as well. Um, I had assumed that it was a predator, either a mountain lion, or we also have a coyote in our area. Um, I've lost several cats over the years trying to figure out how to do like rodent control on our farm. And I had just determined that the cats can't be outside at night because it's not safe for them. So to have the loss happen like mid morning when you're not really expecting a predator load was shocking. Um, and so you had reached out to me through the farming community. I had I had shared on my um, Facebook page, our farm page about the loss and through the farming community, you had heard about our loss and you reached out to me. And for me, I just felt really grateful to have your expertise and you know, your sympathy and um, that you were willing to come out. I didn't, I wasn't aware of the foundation at that time. And so, um, you know, the more knowledge I can get to keep my farm safe and my livestock safe, the better it is for everybody um, in the neighborhood. So having you come to me was a joy. Like I didn't feel intimidated or judged or um, that I had done anything wrong. Um, you know, we had, you had determined that our pen safety was pretty like um, uh, robust at the nighttime, um, mm -hmm. during nighttime hours. And so, um, but what we don't have is any hot wire protecting, you know, for daytime um, predators. And I didn't really even consider that a domestic dog would jump over the fence into our goat pen and kill our dog. That was not, or excuse me, kill our goat. That was just not a consideration yeah. that I had even prepared for, you know. It's a hard, it's a hard one. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to get, you know, too gruesome for people who are listening along, but um, there are some, there are some characteristic things that we look at when we're trying to determine whether this is a mountain lion kill or whether this is a canid. And sometimes coyote kills and domestic dog kills look really similar, but there's also some pretty distinct differences usually between domestic dogs and coyotes too. And in this case, it seemed really clear to me that what was happening was less predatory and more playful which unfortunately um, often results in the death of the domestic animal, but that the goat had been run. And um, people often really underestimate how destructive that can be. I've actually had my cattle run by a 10 pound terrier. You know, it doesn't need to be a big dog to cause a lot of damage that way. Um, you'll often see um, nips and scratches on the back legs. You'll often see foam on the nose that shows that the animal's been running for a long time. Um, sometimes you'll see um, a pattern of wool pulling, but it'll be more chaotic. You know, mountain lions also pull wool and pull fur when they eat their prey, but not typically at the side of a kill. They'll often take the animal away. So, um, you know, a, a, an animal that's been moved is a, a really different scenario. Domestic dogs will often kind of lose interest when an animal dies because it's they're not they're not able to play with it anymore. Um, and let's say that you know very very often um, domestic dogs are 
the number one thing that that people struggle with and they're difficult because a lot of our deterrents that work against native predators don't work as well against dogs domestic radios and lights and things like that well dogs live with humans they aren't afraid of those things usually um and i've i've had um another depredation where we actually had the neighbor's husky on on video on game camera when we were determining what was taking this farm's livestock and the farmer was like you know i really wish it had been a mountain lion because now i have to talk to my neighbor um so it is harder with when it's it's things like that and so i'm i'm interested in in what that was like for you with this you know conclusion that you know you have this neighbor dog that had already had already killed a couple chickens and um, and what that's been like, you know, kind of coming to terms with that and taking steps um, with that in mind. Yeah, so um, I want to just say that our neighbor's dog um, has killed and been caught killing some of our chickens. And, and he was a young puppy and he's got lots of prey drive. And um, but we don't know if it was the neighbor's dog that um, killed our goat. And we have a great relationship with our neighbors. Um, none of our neighbors have fencing. We just, we live in a the coastal zone. And so it's actually really hard to get even fencing approved on the coastal mm. zone. And so kind of everybody's animals free range, you know, including my, my animals free range. We, everyone's doing their best to keep their own animals on their own property. So when we had the loss of the, um, the goat, we've just worked really closely with our neighbors. Um, he was able to get a training collar and we helped, um, uh, with work with him closely. We ended up buying Luna, which I'll get into more of that. That was a mistake, but um, she's a large guardian dog. And so she is a deterrent um, to keep that dog on his side of the fence. And then, um, and then we also have other farm dogs. I have a pit bull who's more of like a guardian of the, the land, who's been able to keep that particular dog at bay. So, you know, I'm neighborly. I I love my neighbors. My dogs, when we first got chickens, I had a couple losses before my dogs realized that it's not okay to chase chickens. So to me, it's more about educating your neighbors mm -hmm. and finding solutions that work for everybody. Um, and, um, and another thing that we are doing this year is we're actually moving currently where I have our livestock housed is right next to my neighbor's property line. And so it's actually really unfair for their dog because we know that their dog is prey driven, um, it wants to get the chickens, the chickens are right where their dog can see it. So we're actually in the process of moving our farm to a safer location further away from their dog, which is, um, kind of, you know, it, it's going to take some time, but we're, we're, we are now safeguarding our area and our livestock in a way because accidents happen. And, um, you know, I, like I said, my dogs have accidentally killed chickens when we first got mm -hmm. the, the dogs. Luna is um, just over a year old, but she's still struggling with not playing with the chickens. And so, um, it's my responsibility to keep my livestock safe. It's my responsibility to um, make sure that I'm not putting my livestock in harm's way. It's not the neighbor's responsibility. So um, mm. it would be really unfair for me to expect them to be 100% keeping their dog on their property when my dogs cross over the creek and go onto their property as well because yeah. it's it's kind of wild here you it's know it's an open range. space you know yeah, yeah and I really I really appreciate your you know kind of empathy and understanding too and I think that that's something that we struggle with a lot especially because a lot of livestock protection laws are pretty draconian you know as a farmer you are within your legal rights to shoot a dog that's harassing livestock 
Um, and I think that it's important to have a, a nuanced perspective there that, you know, a dog that plays with livestock, a dog that kills livestock is not a bad dog necessarily, right. not a dog that would be aggressive to people. They, they just don't know any better. Um, and they are harder to manage for because they live with us so much as, as opposed to the, the mountain lion that is in your area, who is really behaving herself quite well. Yes. You know, um, and that's that's something that it's it's really important to keep in mind. And also, as we go along, um, please, everybody, as questions come up, um, you don't need to wait to ask your questions at the end. You can put them in the Q and A. Um, so, if if there's something you want to ask a question about, um, you know, please just go ahead and and put it in the Q and A, and and we'll get there. So. I, I would love to talk about Luna, and I don't know if if maybe we could like backtrack through some pictures real quick and see puppy Luna. Um, but I think by the time by the time you and I first spoke on the phone, you had already gotten Luna. Yes, you you kind of described you know purchasing this this livestock guardian dog as being like a trauma response, and I'm I'm interested in what this has been like for you, because I, I've seen this a lot and I agree that a lot of people do get these dogs after something's happened, kind of reaction in a reactionary kind of a way, not realizing how much work they are and how long it takes before they're actually an effective guardian. I think you've done an awesome job with Luna. Um, and I also think it's, it's possible to like do a really good job and also acknowledge that like yeah, if, if if you'd know now what you knew then that it was a it was a reflexive decision, and um, so I'd I'd love to hear your perspective on that because I think it's one that a lot of people could relate to and would benefit from. Right, and um, so I have a background in rearing dogs. I have had dogs my entire life. Um, I, we, I lived on a little farm when I was growing up, not on this scale that I have or the scale that you have, but just a small hobby farm. And so I've always had dogs. And even when I was a kid, I was in 4-H and did dog obedience and trained dogs. So I'm really a seasoned dog owner. So I did not realize that large guardian dogs are a completely different breed of dogs they're independent, they need a shepherd, they um, they recall is very difficult. There, there's all kinds of things when it comes to training a large guardian dog that I didn't know. So my experience was we lost, um, we lost our goat and I had posted on it my social media. So immediately I got all of these, uh, this uh, bad advice that I needed a large guardian dog and that day, somebody knew somebody that had a litter of puppies. So I had called this rancher, and, and what I know now is I didn't get very sound advice from the breeder and the person that was selling the puppies because he had told me that they know how to do their job and I could just take this puppy and put her in with my livestock and she'd be fine. Now, I'm sure that is his experience because when I went to his farm, he had like 10 large guardian dogs. And when you have, when you're rearing puppies with other large guardian dogs, the dogs train the puppies. And that was not my case. So as I'm picking up Luna, I discover that she's not a 14 week old puppy. She's like a six week old puppy as I'm loading her into my car. So now I have an infant puppy that I've just purchased and I'm still of the mindset that I'm just going to put her in this pen with my goat and she's going to know how to do her job. Um, I have joined a bunch of social media support groups of livestock dogs and then you have been a huge help as you own livestock dogs and I've, I've learned that a large a livestock guardian dog, they take about two years to mature. Um, they take about two years of training. And a Great Pyrenees is really not the fit for this farm. Um, although we love Luna, we're keeping Luna and she's doing great, but their, their deterrent is their bark. And especially when they're young for the first two years, they can bark 
incessantly, like because they're insecure and they're just trying to keep um, the livestock away. So anytime I hear somebody saying, oh, get a large guardian dog, don't get a large guardian dog unless you have two years to train them. You know, it's better to get a seasoned animal that knows their job. Um, you know, like the chickens, keeping the chicken safe is our number one. The chickens are the biggest loss because they're the most vulnerable. They free range. Um, they get in areas they're not supposed to get in. And I was assuming that this puppy was going to be able to not chase the chickens, not have prey drive. And that that's just not the case. So still at over a year old, I can't trust Luna with my flock of chickens without being supervised. So yeah. it's, if you're going to get a large, if you're going to have livestock, it's, I would recommend you start with the puppy, train the puppy, and then start introducing the livestock. I, I did it backwards. Like I said, I got unsound advice from the person who was trying to sell the dogs. And I think you came two days after I had my goat loss and I had already had the puppy and you were just like, oh no, this is really bad, you know, and, and not in a judgy way, but just like, I didn't know what I had bitten off basically, you know, it's and, um, so even as a sound uh, dog trainer with lots of different types of dog experience, large guardian dogs are a complete different breed from any other dog I've ever tried to train in my they life. Really, they really are. And unfortunately, your experience is really common. Um, it's common in um, the United States for people to have this kind of, oh, just throw them in the pasture and they'll figure it out sort of attitude. Um, that is not the relationship that people have with these dogs in the parts of the world that they actually come from. Yeah. You know, and, parts um, of Northern and Eastern Europe. And on my, I only have a little under a four acre farm and it's not mm -hmm. fenced. And what I didn't know about, yeah. um, <laughs> large guardian dogs is, is they choose their boundary. So if Luna decides that 10 acres away from here is her boundary, yeah. that is where she's going to go. And so at this point, um, we're working on fencing our entire property this season. That's what we're yeah. working on this year. But at this point, I can't even let her run off leash because they really don't have any recall. So if she sees mm -hmm. a raven, like I've had her run and like launch herself off the end of our bluff and she's on the beach and running over to the neighbor's house yeah. with zero recall because she thinks she's protecting from the ravens flying over. So it's been a really that, big challenge. That is what they're like. Um, you know, these dogs um, were bred over hundreds and hundreds of years to protect very large areas. They often will feel like their territory is anywhere from dozens to hundreds of acres um, they want to roam, um, they have little to no recall, um, they are their own thing. And at the same time, they're also a dog. And there tends to be this, um, dichotomy in thinking about them where people either don't treat them like a dog at all, and we'll just put them out in the field and ignore them, or even tell you not to interact with them, that that would spoil them. Um, or they, treat them as though they're the same as every other kind of dog. And they're really neither, you know, like a, a young puppy is a baby. They need to be in the house. They are themselves vulnerable to depredation. They can be prey. Um, they take a long time to grow up and they do learn from their elders. Um, the, the biggest asset for a young guardian dog is an older guardian dog. Um, the thing about them is in studies over the whole planet, um, from Europe to Africa to Central America, they are pretty much the most effective deterrent that we have. It's anywhere from 96 to 98% effectiveness. But they take a huge amount of work, a huge amount of training. They're high liability um, in terms of insurance, especially in the United States. And um, they're loud you know, and so that they can be d difficult to manage in a small setting. So 
I, I think that a lot of people, um, you know, for, for myself, you know, often contract grazing on, um, you know, wilderness um, protected land on, on wildlife preserve land, they're absolutely invaluable. Like I wouldn't want to be a grazer without them, but I, neither would I tell everybody to go out and get one. Um, so it, it is this, this really mixed bag. And I think that you're doing a great job with her. And I also think that you're learning like, yeah, you got to fence your whole property and, and she's not going to be effective with chickens for a while. Um, yeah. and in general, the, the livestock guardian dogs do form emotional attachments and bonds with sheep and goats, um, as other mammals that they really don't with chickens. Right. Um, they'll protect them, but they don't tend to see them as pack mates or friends or family members. They're just too different. So you can teach them not to, not to play with the chickens or kill the chickens, but you can't really teach them to care about the chickens. Um, and even good poultry dogs generally don't care about chickens. <laughs> um, but um, so on your scale where you're, it's a, it's a small farm, you're in a rural neighborhood, it's a pretty wild area that there's, there's a lot of open borders. You know, we talk about um, two basic categories of um, ways of protecting livestock. There's deterrence and there's exclusion. And it looks like Michael building a coop shelter. Chicken coop, yeah. Yeah. And deterrence is kind of what Luna's doing and what your other dogs are doing like more passively where they're barking, it's their presence, it's their establishment of territory is a deterrence. And then you've got exclusion, which is where you've usually got a physical barrier, um, something like your chicken tractors and like your chicken coops and like your night shelters. And then there's this, this category of scare devices where you use light and sound um, as, as a scare device. And those are not really appropriate for your scale. They wouldn't be appropriate for your neighbors, wouldn't be appropriate for the space that you're in. Um, so I, I actually haven't seen, I, I, was, I really appreciated getting all these pictures of your chicken tractors and coops because a lot of those were not there the last time I visited. Um, and so I'd love to, um, I really briefly, cause you know, we're, we're moving through this, but I'd love to hear a little bit about what that process was like for, for you. Did you find these designs online? Did you use trial and error? And, um, and, you know, can, if you talk a little bit about deciding which tools to use based on where you are. Yeah. Um, so my husband loves learning off of YouTube, so he will watch like 500 videos before we build anything to the point where I'm like, no more videos, let's just build it, you know, and um, one thing that um, we have learned and um, a lot of people don't know is that most um, smaller predators, the coyotes and the skunks and the raccoons, the skunks and the raccoons and the possums are, are a big um, problem for the chickens. And, um, but they will go to the edge of the structure. So if this is the wall, they'll come right to the corner of the bottom. So mm -hmm. we have all of our um, uh, chicken tractors and all of our structures, we lay, hog panel or chicken wire a foot inside the structure and a foot outside the structure so when an animal comes to the edge of the structure they're digging where there's wire and they can't get in and um, most predators aren't um, wise enough to set back like go back and back and back and then go underneath the hardware cloth um, so all of our structures, we try to build for multi-use. Um, so we try to make it so I can move baby chickens in, big chickens in. Um, we try to build all of our structures where if I had to move the whole flock of chickens into, let's just say the goat run area, that the goat run area can keep them safe. So um, we didn't really get like a design we kind of use what we have on our property we're really um, big into upcycling so um for instance we have 
tons of hog panels. And we got those because I saw a farm going out of business online and they wanted somebody to come down, come and take down all the, their fencing. And so we went as a family and did that. And we scored, you know, probably 50 hog panels um, to build all these infrastructures. Yeah. So, um, Sorry, yeah, Rhonda, so for, for folks who don't know, hog panel um, is kind of a generic term for the, the really thick rigid diameter um, fencing wire. So rather than being flexible, it's kind of a panel that you can then cut and use in various ways. And it's like, it's very handy to have around farms. Yeah. Um, another thing I um, that is kind of a little bit off topic, but um, we, we currently are not debutting any of our goats. Um, the way our goat was killed, um, she was, her face was pretty dismembered. And I feel like had she had her protection that she like her universal or God given or whatever you believe, like goats are supposed to have those horns for protection. And um, so we've changed our practices on our farm where we're not debutting any of our goats anymore. Um, that gives them that whole level of protection too. So um, th that's a process that happened in America that we, our farmers yeah. here invented to make it so they don't get their heads stuck in fencing and, and things like that. And instead of, instead of taking that protection away from them, we've just provided fencing that they can't get their heads stuck in. So um mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's another thing. If you're starting a small homestead, like know what farm animals you're going to get. So all yeah. of our hog panels that we use are a four by four um, smaller square. Um, so if you're going to get goats and you're not going to debud them, make, just make sure that whatever you're getting to enclose them is going to be the safest for your livestock. And and for, for folks who don't know, debudding is a process of removing the horn buds before they grow in. Because when you see when the babies are born, they don't have horns. They grow their horns later and those those buds can be removed. And it is something that, you know, is, is not allowed in some places um, and for good reason. And we don't do it either, but when I was managing a flock of goats um, doing brush mitigation work, they all came from dairies. They were all boy, you know, kind of the industry just treats them as discards. So they ended up being our, our brush removal crew and most of them had been disbudded and a lot of things can happen later, like, you know, partial disbudding where they still grow a remnant of a horn and it can... It, it can, gnarly stuff can happen. And I agree with you that, you know, goats having horns is another, you know, that's part of their defense mechanism. And, um, you know, it can be quite a deterrent for a dog. You know, I've, I've seen, um, I've seen a goat send a dog end over end, you know, with its horns, you know. Um, so in the, in a little bit of time that we have left here, I want to take some questions and we've got a couple really good ones, but I also wanted to, to come back to, you know, ranchers and homesteaders, they often feel hesitant to contact Mountain Lion Foundation for support. So they, they could be worried about being judged. They could be worried about being turned into law enforcement for, you know, any like code violations that I might see while I'm there. They could be worried that, you know, I'm there with an agenda or that they're going to get politicized and not get helped. Um, and so I'm just interested in, you know, like, what would you say to those people? And like, would you recommend like our coexistence outreach to a friend, you know, if, if somebody had a similar thing happen, um, because really, you know, what we, what we want is the best case scenario for wildlife, but in that way, like our interests are often really aligned, you know, the best, the best outcome for wildlife and the best outcome for livestock are usually the same. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you had, um, been put in contact with me just through word of mouth. And of course, um, from the farming community, I have had, had known of you through the farming community, community. And so I just felt really honored for your expertise um, to have you out. I was very excited to have you out and get any, um, any expertise that you could help me to keep my farm safe. And so 
I'm all about education. Like to somebody who doesn't have a homestead, I'm a plethora of education for them. You who have been farming for a lot longer in this lifestyle, you're a plethora of information for me, you know? And so um, I think if you're just closed off to being educated by people, that's kind of a stance of ego, you know? And obviously I love my goat. It was very traumatic to have her die. And then I'm just left with one goat, which goats cannot be the only goat on the property that she was very depressed. And um, she came became almost got dog-like um, in the, bet in between before mm -hmm. I start, built her up another herd for herself. And so having you out was not intimidating. Um, you actually were pretty impressed by the infrastructure that we already had in place. And um, with the exception of adding some hot wire to our at perimeter fencing, um, we had really had it pretty dialed in. So I would highly recommend mm -hmm. other ranchers or farmers, even if they haven't had a deprivation, to have um, you out to look at their farm and to make sure that their livestock is safe and to get advice and mm -hmm. um, feedback. So Thank for you. me, it wasn't intimidating at all. I felt really mm -hmm. honored by your presence on our farm and grateful that you were able to take the time out. And, you know, I didn't even know we had this resource in our area. So uh, for me, it was super beneficial to have you out and to just establish a relationship with you. Um, you know, even though your your goal is to protect and to coexist with the natural wildlife, you took a lot of time to help me with Luna and, um, you know, tell me even what I was doing that was incorrect with how to raise her. And you've just been a huge asset for me, um, you know, through our developing our relationship um, and, I feel like I could reach out to you anytime and you would be here to help um, for, for a multitude of, of reasons. So I just really appreciate mm -hmm. the foundation that you guys are out there and um, that I hope that people use you, um, especially in this community as a resource because you. too many farmers, um, removing the natural wildlife is not should not be the first resort. You know, they were here first. They deserve to be here. They deserve to coexist among us. You know, um, you. we have a big natural creek uh, that runs off right through our property that it just brings the bears in and the lions in and the, the deer in. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, I'm not going to be able to prevent them from being in this area. And I shouldn't because we're intruding on their, their natural habitat. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rhonda. And we have a couple questions that I can answer really quickly. Um, one from Matt at Mid Peninsula Open Space, which, hi, Matt, thank you, um, is what areas are MLF depredation response services available throughout California or nationwide? Nationwide. Um, I am geographically located in Northern California. Um, we have other staff and volunteers in different parts of this state and in other states. And I also do phone and video consultations. So um, anywhere that anybody's having a, um, a concern or an issue, um, you can always reach out to me. Um, and another question, how can people who don't have livestock use this knowledge about the mountain lion foundation's depredation work to help lions? Um, spread the word. Let, let folks know. Um, we also do ongoing training and, and education. I think that, you know, our, our website is, is a source of information. Our staff is a source of information. And um, it, it, you don't have to be, you know, a homesteader or a, a rancher yourself. Um, to use it. A lot of it applies to your domestic pets too, um, cats and dogs. Um, so, and why is this work important in California specifically? Um, preventing lions from being killed after a depredation helps prevent the loss of genetic diversity within populations of mountain lions. They're already suffering from a lot of other threats. Um, depredation killings also tend to gear the population younger and younger cats tend to have more conflicts. So you end up in this treadmill cycle of conflict. Um, for instance, your mountain lion, Rhonda, that lives in your neighborhood isn't bothering anybody. 
Right. Um, so how do we contact the MLF to ask them to come out and help? Um, email. Um, email is great. Um, and uh, Matt, again, from Mid Peninsula Open Space, does MLF provide any funding opportunities for predation deterrence? Yes, we do. Um, we provide uh, all kinds of support, uh, depending on a person's um, place and, um, and needs. Um, often we'll provide things like um, scare deterrence, um, occasionally we full on do a pen build and we'll build a secure shelter. Um, so yes, we do that as well. Um, and let's see, um, here's a question to, um, really quickly about building a lion proof pig and goat structure. You want to think about the walls, the door, the roof, and the floor. <laughs> I think that you remember me saying that, Rhonda. <laughs> yeah, yes. So um, the roof of the structure needs to support 250 pounds. Um, the openings of the structure need to be smaller than a mountain lion's paw. Um, and you also need to think about digging predators around the base. We'll often lay fencing um, at the base and cover it. Um, mountain lions aren't going to dig so much, but domestic dogs do and coyotes do. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy, you know. Um, you can make these out of dog kennel material. I've seen people make them out of pallets as long as you cover the pallet with wire. Um, and then I think our, this is going to be our last question because we are running out of time here, but what were the specific recommendations from MLF for your situation, Rhonda? Um, I think, you the, know, yeah. Our biggest... Um, the biggest recommendation from you was the hot wire along running along the bottom and along the top of our exterior pin. Um, that's because we close in our animals every night. So we close in our chicken coop. We close in our goats into, I call it a manger, but it's kind of a smaller barn. Um, it's, it's not a barn, but, and um, so in, like I said earlier, all of our structures have hog panel underneath. So the only thing I was really missing is the jump over and dig under deterrent from the exterior of our pins. And um, like I said, we're working on electrifying our entire four acres, um, which is going to help too. So because I already had sound structures in place, the weakness that we had on our farm was the animals the predators being able to go over the top or under our fences. Yeah. And sometimes that's all it is. Sometimes it's one recommendation and um, sometimes it's a lot. It really, it depends. And in your case, you were really doing everything right. You had this X factor. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's our best case scenario that happens to a lot of folks. And so thank you so much for your, your, um, vulnerability about, you know, being willing to share your experience and your trial and error. And thank you for, um, for being here and taking this time with us. And thank you for your questions, everybody too. Um, th this will be on, on YouTube and available, um, into the future and we're available. Our staff is available. Um, our next webinars are on August 16th, Hiking Through Lion Country, where we're going to talk more specifically about coexisting with wildlife on the trail and in nature. And then on September 20th um, with um, Ben Goldfarb, um, we're going to talk about crossings, which are a huge, huge topic in, in wildlife um, in wildlife management and survival when roadways are are such a um, such a dangerous obstacle. So Rhonda, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you for being um, a model for other ranchers and homesteaders. Word of mouth really is the most powerful tool that we have. Um, you know, it, it ranchers and homesteaders they they tend to they tend to hear a lot from agencies from nonprofits. And they tend to actually do what their peers recommend. Um, so, yeah. I just want to let you know that I really appreciate you and all the work that you're doing and your outreach. And um, you're just uh, in a valuable um, 
community member. And so I'm just so grateful for our relationship and um, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody. And um, yeah, have a great rest of your day. And thank you to everybody who attended. Um, we're always really happy to have you. All right. Thank you so much.